The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to explore the full curriculum and latest training offerings. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. Oh, I think we just lost Kevin. Uh oh. I saw something rebooting. Welcome back, everyone. This is Security Weekly, the put that in your pipe and smoke it edition. <laughs> Did you see that trick? So Very clever. this was a suggestion from uh, my friend Jorge, who runs Tobacconist University. And I said, you know, I'm not really, I, I, I try and smoke the pipe, but I'm not really into it. Um, and he's like, dude, you ever get down to the end of your cigar and you really want to smoke it, but it's just too hot to hold in your hand? I'm like, yeah. He's like, stick it in your pipe. Stick it in your pipe. I'm like, dude, that is Genius. such, why didn't I, it's one of those like, why didn't I think of that? Think of all those, ideas. those cigar butts you've wasted I know. all the years. I know. And now I'm doing it now and it's awesome. It's working out pretty well. Good. I like it. I'm glad to hear it. Anyway, what's going on in the security news? ISIS. You wanted to talk about ISIS. <laughs> I asked if it was going to come up in conversation. <clears throat> well, the security news this week is just riddled with how ISIS uses encryption not so much. Double rot 13. Double rot <laughs> yeah. 13 as it was described. <laughs> I saw that too. Yeah, I've, I've been watching that and, and my favorite part is that, oh, there are um, minutes or uh, or even during the attack, people were already blaming Snowden, and um, with the exception of Donald Trump, that was saying, "Hey, look, they have uh, stringent gun laws, and us. That's why they're getting um, <laughs> killed." Uh, but uh, the, the way I see it is, people kind of jump at that bandwagon very too quickly. Like, oh, they're using encryption, they're doing this and that, and now that we're a couple of days into the investigation and the actions to. Uh, corral this uh, dipshits. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is that, yeah, the French intelligence uh, apparatus actually knew about them. They had phone call information about them. They were already sus uh, suspected of actions. Uh, what they didn't know was what was their time frame of action. Um, so encryption actually never played any kind of role in in them not achieving their goal of having these people under surveillance or having these people under radar. Um, Bless the, 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 the way I see it is, it is we're seeing a lot of fear mongering uh, from people out there and the media go, jumping on it going like, hey, this is a good story. Let's run with it. Let's prep a very good headline. Oh, so yeah. Get they get some more noise on it. Yeah, which is totally with out, that of, out of character for media. You, you see him running with any retractions going, oh, our bad, maybe encryption is actually good because mm -hmm. I haven't seen any of those yet. Yep. Have in you fact, ever if, seen anybody in fact, in the You know what it shifted to, right? Jared Fogel got in a sentence today. So now it's not only do terrorists use it, but so do pedophiles. It's textbook. It's for the children so the terrorists don't win. Uh, yeah, the, the way I see it is, as I was telling a friend, one of the things that many of these terrorists hate is our the freedoms that we have and and... Uh, which is around our culture and what they see like a pervert, perverted way of life and all of that stuff. And um, terrorism is that. So they're basically upset that us they can't and, stream Netflix and Hulu the way we can. Uh, or what we see in, uh, in them. And see, I think and then they, they go they, and they, use their encrypted VPNs, and we have to stop that now. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're winning. I hate to admit it, but they're winning. They're getting so us actually, to change our way of life. Michael, actually, jump on that. There was one retraction. The New York Times did. Oh, good pull their initial article talking about this. Hmm. Well, they pulled it. Is that the same as a retraction? No. I'm not trying to split hairs, Kevin. I mean, I, I think it's a good <laughs> point. I, I'm just, yeah, right. I, I got no hairs to split. All right. Well, so I, I'm not trying. I'm just saying, all right, well, it's good. I mean, I just, I, I think it's interesting because uh, those are the types of things that, that terrify me. And if we get people too spun up on, no, yeah, we don't need it anyway. And wow. Okay. 
No, I, I, my, my biggest worry is we've been talking here about our customers not securing their stuff very well. We look at government and we see something like the OPM bridge where where all of the, the secret data of spies and everybody who has any type of clearance in the government was not even being protected. And now we're talking about putting keys or back yeah. doors into stuff and the government's going like, no, don't worry. We're trust the government. Us. We're going to keep it keep keep it safe. Um, you can trust us. You, you, it, not even your biggest secrets you can keep safe. How are you going to keep this safe? Stop asking questions, Carlos. That's <laughs> <my>. <laughs> Don't make us put you in the list again. Yeah. Oh, I can't. I don't even want to guess how many lists I'm on. <sighs> I'm in two. You're on the nice list. Well, you're on my nice list, Michael. Uh, anyway. Well, see, I like going to Paul's Utopia. So that's it's, right. It's, and, it's, and that Paul's list Utopian only exists list. in Paul's Utopian world. So. <laughs> now, um, what, what I find funny is Anonymous going like, yeah, we're hacktivists and we're going to bring down ISIS. Um, yeah, what does everyone think about? I've been trying to form an opinion about that. I have an opinion. I, I, I guess I have an sort opinion. <laughs> I'm kind of torn. In one way, I kind of think it's good. I'm kind of like on the side of, yes, go punish the bad guys, right? But on the other side, I'm kind of like, here's this group, and they can just go punish anyone seemingly but aren't, their they, own aren't, ideals. aren't they doing exactly what they espouse to fight against? Yeah, they're just going and picking on people. Yeah, In so this case, it happens to be hopefully the bad people. But how do we know? But how do we know? Exactly. How are they making? The, how are right. you know, you know, uh, you know? The big debate the last couple of days is letting in refugees, and how do we know if they're uh, really ISIS, you know, or not? Um, you know, how how is anonymous picking and choosing uh, who they're targeting? Right, and do and do we trust them because they're not government, or some other organized entity? And, and not only that, what what impact are they going to actually have? I know the um, news um, seems to think they're already having an impact. Um, but they're, that's they're just, I think that's just the media in terms of media, it. right? Of, of media and uh, being out there. For me, impact would be like, hey, we've been able to capture traffic from their internal communications. Yep. We've been able to send people over to Syria and they're intercepting their radio calls and these are their channels and all this. That would be impact. The only problem is that they would be putting themselves so far away that it could happen what happened already in Mexico. Like, hey, we're going against the cartels. Cartels kidnap a couple of the anonymous hacktivists. Okay, we're living the cartels alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't. I'm kind of torn what, on the issue. The, the thing I find, well, it, I think a lot of people are. So what's what I find more fascinating about it is when anonymous does something that people don't like, they're happy to come out and say, "Well, oh, screw them. The, right. Why are they allowed to do this? Catch them." But Anonymous comes out and says, yeah, you know what? Screw ISIS. We're going after ISIS. Uh, my Facebook feed is loaded with people saying, yeah, about time. Hopefully they do something. This is promising. Yeah. And They're I, like I'm superheroes always, now, dude. Yeah, I'm just always interested in, in in our ability to have selective moral outrage about things and <laughs> and and to, to change on it. I think it's interesting. Um, I'll try to dig up the link. I didn't do it in time. But did you guys see that there was, there was a link where somebody interviewed Jester? about this very thing and, and he had some fairly uh, pointed unkind things to say so no, i thought no. it was an interesting read uh i'll dig it up i'll, I'll mm. put it in the no I, I found well my to be honest my wife found a meme or saw a meme that had just you know whoever was being jester at the time superimposed over that was somebody tweeting not the 72 virgins they were counting on <laughs> 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 Okay, that's funny. <laughs> that was funny. Um, now, I want, uh, uh, go ahead, uh, On a separate note, what I, I, I would like to point out is that now we're moving from a world where um, you have some of these groups before ISIS used to, the impact that we used to have from them was they were doing defacements of pages and yeah. uh, doing stupid things. Now we have them shooting people and putting bombs, and now we're seeing a shift. Uh, from some of these groups into a more kinetic kind of side on our side. Many people actually didn't care about the refugees. Many people didn't care about the civilians being killed over in Syria. And now people do care. 
Um, we, we, sort of. We're seeing, a, we're for we're a seeing a, 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 some shifts in the way stuff is happening. Well, we don't care until it strikes too Impact close us. to home. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Uh, Great um, target ISIS, but yeah, the, the, bad The number other one terrorist organization in the world today is an organization called Boko Haram. They're, they've killed thousands, but they happen to kill Africans that we largely don't care about and don't worry about. But they're the number one terrorist organization in the world today in terms of number of killings. Interesting. But who knows who Boko Haram is or where they're operating? Hmm. Um, I want to. I'm going to change gears. Go if for that's it. Okay. Uh, I want to sure. talk about the most horrible hacking atrocity in the world today, right now, and that is. Is it another WordPress? No, bomb? it's a coffee maker. Oh, the coffee maker. Okay. Why <laughs> mess with coffee? You can mess with a lot of things, but damn it, don't mess with our coffee. This is the eye coffee kit hackable smart eye kettle. Um, it's an eye, th well, I don't, I don't, what is the actual product? They call it an eye thing. There's a lot well, of marketing. It's an eye kettle 2.0. If, if um, it is a kettle, isn't it for tea instead of coffee? Uh, sorry, so there's two <laughs> things here. You're right, Carlos. So there's a Wi-Fi coffee machine and an eye kettle um, okay. that they found independent vulnerabilities in um, that are, in fact, different. Um, the attack against the coffee machine is they can get it to uh, trick it into upgrading its firmware, making the machine temporarily unavailable, which is the worst atrocity in the world, making my coffee maker unavailable because I love my coffee. Um, it also, um, and this is an interesting thing them. about embedded systems that I've noticed, is that in certain ones, doing a firmware upgrade resets it back to its factory default settings. So if you had your coffee maker so that you could trigger it from your phone and give you notifications when your coffee is ready, because how I don't know how I've lived without that all this time. I really Now I have to get one of these in the office because I, I want that. Right. Um, the question is, does it make good coffee, though? Because there's... Does that really matter, though? It does, if though. You, if you no. can make the coffee, you know, before you get here? I know, it's a tough trade-off, Jeff. It's a tough trade-off. I like my good coffee, though. Mm -hmm. um, you, you break my coffee machine, I'm going to... Right yeah, here. it's it's a serious offense, right, Carlos? This is serious yes. business. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, it's probably the it's first of many coffee makers that'll be found to be vulnerable. As I just yeah, saw the a commercial the other day for a refrigerator that's got a built-in <coughs> K machine, K cup. Oh, really? Yeah, interesting. So it just brews it right from the refrigerator. Now, I don't have, know if it's automated or not, but they have refrigerators that have the camera inside of them, so that when you're at the supermarket, you can look inside your refrigerator and see what you need or don't need. Now, now, cool. now, Paul. Based on both stories, the way mm -hmm. I see it is, it depends on what is the actual impact, real world. For example, yeah, you can break my coffee maker. Yes, I'm gonna be pissed. I'm gonna have a headache when I wake up at four to go to gym. Uh, but um, yeah, it sucks, but it, it's not that big of an impact. Now, when we look at the uh, kettle, the kettle is exposing uh, your Wi Fi credentials. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a big impact for me. Now you're in my Wi Fi, now you're in my network where my kit locks on into stuff when I have my NAS, which shares with the pictures and other stuff. Or uh, from where I browse, you can modify my router, you can. You're inside my home at that point. Yeah, at that the, moment. the kettle so the is more of a matrix, gateway a, to a, do more evil things, Carlos, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Yep. So now, now you're, we're looking at the risk. What is the risk? How does it impact me? Now, kettle, I find it uh, dangerous. Uh, the um, coffee machine, I just find it annoying. Front door. <laughs> yep. No, I totally agree. I mean, there's really. We don't need to punish the tea drinkers of the world either. But do you want to put your kids at risk so you can make your cup of coffee 10 minutes before you get to the office? It's and true. have it ready when it's there. It's, it's, it's like in my, in my case, I like home automation. But when you look at my home automation, one, I don't depend on it to be my home alarm. Second, uh, my home automation doesn't control any of my locks. Um, so it, it all depends. How do you implement it? What is the risk? What, is this reverse is psychology? It? So your home automation controls <laughs> all of your locks. Okay. <laughs> and, and another thing that we have to look at is from an enterprise point of view, 
am I bringing some of this crap into my network? So we're, we're, we're back to what we've been talking for years, Paul, with embedded yeah. security. I know that you, you were a proponent of it many years ago and people were proponing uh, what you were saying like, ah, you feel monger, uh, fear monger, ah, that's bullshit. Uh, th th there's no risk on it. And now people are going like, damn, they're hacking my fucking router at home and um, they're getting to my traffic. Shit, oh, look what happened in Mexico. They hack all of this two wires and they were able to redirect everybody to the wrong bank. Shit, this stuff is dangerous. Now we're seeing with the IoT stuff, um, the same thing. People were going like, IoT, yeah, what risk? There's nothing going to happen in my network due to IoT. Now people are going like, shit, it's exposing passwords. Crap. Now we're starting to see people going to it, but still haven't seen enough of an impact for stuff to change. Uh, we still don't see Linksys doing automatic updates of, of all of their devices. Same thing for bulking with their routers. And there has been some downsides to it. Are we going to see that with IoT? Right now, C-Wave, there's no way to auto-update the firmware of C-Wave devices. Same thing for ZigBee, same thing for Insteon. Um, and now we're moving to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, you know, in this particular case, I can see enterprises adopting this technology, right? Sure. Um, if you are building a new office and you want to keep your employees happy and well caffeinated, you might have this technology in your office. Right. And then, like you said before, Carlos, like some of these attacks are really damaging. If it's leaking the Wi-Fi password, that, that could lead to other bad things happening. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, many times people didn't saw it that way in the enterprise, uh, for example, for VoIP. And now we see that people are taking VoIP security quite seriously. Before VoIP was in the same subnet as everything else, uh, it, it, it comes to that risk and people learning the hard way. Um, now we're going to start seeing like, hey, uh, what is that IP camera? Why do what's you have a whole new there? wrinkle to bring your own device? Now it's bring your own coffee maker at one level. Um, you know, everybody's got it on their desk, so their coffee is ready by the time they That's show true. up to the office in the That's morning. That's true. I can see that. But, you know, but like you said, how long before they make a, uh, you know, a large coffee pot for the whole office and, and have it programmed so the coffee's ready by the time the first person gets I'm, there? I'm, the putting it on sends out an email. I'm putting it on Kickstarter right now. There you go. It sends out an email. Hey, coffee's <laughs> ready. That's right. There's a mad dash. No, mine's going to have a wheel on it so that you can have like up to 20 different cups brewed exactly the way you want it. Nice. I like it. I like yeah. it. Yeah. And when you say security, I'll make sure that it has biometrics so that you can only get the cup of coffee you brewed. It's kind of like that Jaeger bomb thing I saw, which is bottles of Jaegermeister and Red Bull with the straw that goes into like 20 of them. <laughs> You should put some Jägermeister this in your coffee. This is so you much should, more. You should important. have a Jägermeister slot. That would yeah, that and, would and increase we'll, let's, productivity. Let's, we'll do some Baileys. Yeah, uh, and uh, and some other things so that you know if it's that kind of day. No yeah, that's right. There's the I'm having a bad day checkbox. <laughs> this is so much more important than you know whether anonymous can make a difference against ISIS or not. So <laughs> way more. It's more important wait, wait, in wait, Paul's wait utopian wait, world. It's <laughs> more important wait than they declare more on coffee. Then you're screwed. Uh, that's Here's right. The, no, right? Because I've started to see people talk about this recently. I think we touched on it last week too, which is the, haven't we had these discussions? Now we're all screwed. We're going to live through it again. Well, right. So that means it's time to change that conversation. How do you do that? You bring people in with questions. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, when you look at the social side of, of anything where you want to in, infect the thinking, it, right, which could be positive or negative, you tell stories. And what we've learned, we just talked about encryption, where the story ran. Doesn't matter if we liked it or not, the mm. story ran. So it's not about countering it with negative stories. It's actually, I, I think we need to start thinking through and preparing for the positive stories. Amplify the good. And be ready when somebody comes to us, instead of just going, oh yeah, that, that crap's bad, you're just gonna kill you, man, it's, it's horrible. Say, yeah, look, I mean, look at all that awesome convenience. Here's some questions that I ask. Here's some things that I look for. And when somebody goes, wait, 
what do we do about that? You could say, look, I, I want to know that if they have automatic firmware updates. And they go, what the hell is that? We need to be prepared to explain that. And, and, that's, and that's where I think, Paul, you know, that's when I ask a lot of these questions. I think we've got some opportunities to look at. You know, there's three things we want people to do. This is I've, I've mentioned to you before. I'm, I'm trying to build out a model of mindset around minimum viable security. And I've got some other stuff that's slightly more pressing for me at the moment. But when we get to it, th this is where we can start to ask those questions and the startups start to think about it. Mm. Look, I get it. You're at your minimum viable product stage. You're on Kickstarter. You're real excited and happy. And, and did you have a full-blown conceptual security model? No. Okay. No worries. Did you think about it? And if we can start flipping that answer from what, what are you talking about to, yeah, and here's what we're doing for now. And this is containerizing what we're able to do. And when we go from MVP to operational product, we're going to change our security model to go with it. And there's some other stuff we'd love to add in. I mean, like, it's just, it's, it's a mindset shift. And the way that we get there is by helping people ask more intelligent questions about it. It's not making statements and declarative statements and confusing statements. It's just engaging them. But then we have to be prepared for where those conversations go. And we're, we're not there yet. We have an opportunity. And that those are some of the things that I'd like to see. And by the way, then, if people have ideas or suggestions or places where they're having these conversations and hitting challenges, that's where we can do a service and start tackling some of that stuff. At least I'm happy to do it. I, I read an article <clears throat> this week about U.S. lawmakers ma being advised to consider allowing companies to hack back to China. <laughs> What do you guys think about that? <laughs> I've never been a fan. It it brings up a lot of questions for me. I mean, obviously, I've you know done a lot with active defense and offensive countermeasures. But one of the things that John Strand and I focus very heavily on is knowing who you're hacking back yep. and yep. doing that with permission from authorities if you are, in fact, hacking back. And it's interesting. A lot of things we talk about, the reason we moved from some of the of active defense uh, to offensive countermeasures and really didn't call it hacking back is because it's more about setting traps and not so much about hacking back. When we talk about mm -hmm. like sheer hacking back, there are some g concerns. And I don't mean to sound like it's completely unjustified that if China's hacking into us, we should be hacking into them. But who are you giving authority to, to yep. be able to do that? Like just anyone, like any major corporation. Oh, look, China's hacking us. So well, we can just hack them back. That's a dangerous notion. Is it really China? How do, how do you verify that? How do you how do you verify it's actually China? Yeah, it could be an IP address. Who cares of a as box. long as you're doing something? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but the repercussions. For for example, um, what if all of a sudden you're hitting a manufacturing plant that somebody else in the U.S. depends on? <laughs> like yeah. every manufacturing of electronics <laughs> in the U.S. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, it is a slippery slope. The way I see it, that's just stupid just to allow companies to, like, if it is in China, hack back. No, bullshit. It, 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 I don't care what it is. Don't hack back. Um, not, not hacking back in terms of, oh, they did a denial of service, so let me now do a denial of service myself, or uh, they, they breached my systems, now let me go and breach them and steal their data. I I don't like that. I, it's too wild west. What I mean, what would be the objective? I mean, does the, the article you read does it talk about a goal for the hacking back? Is I mean, are they trying no, to DOS really. the perpetrator? No, they, they are, really don't. Are, aren't we at what? war? We're at war, man. You gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta punch back. I don't I don't know. I've, I've never understood. Space Rogue and his BDUs and his uh, keyboard. Mm, yeah, exactly. Are ready for cyber war. <laughs> you know, I'm only half joking when I say this, but I think we should bring back letters of Mark. Let's let's go. Let's let's let bring back what, Mike? Sorry, letters, letters of, of Mark. Mark. Can you this was uh, yeah, back in the days of of pirates and and sailing, it, you could uh, if you could be a privateer, mm -hmm. and if there was somebody who had wronged a country, the country would give you a letter of Mark, which meant you were. Uh, it's kind of like a, a what we'd call a modern day bounty hunter. Mm -hmm. They could go track that down, and they could bring the vessel back. It would be sold. The people would be dealt with, and uh, you know you'd be compensated for it. So you were basically authorized to go after it. Yeah, fine. Do that then. That, that, that reminds me of the book uh, Ghost Fleet. I don't know if you've read it. I haven't. But it, I'd probably enjoy it. Uh, highly recommended. One of the things that uh, – one of the parts in the book is that 
uh, one of the characters goes to Congress and act, asks to become a privateer to act on their behalf to take over a space there station. There you go. All right. Yeah, it reminds me of a movie I saw a while ago where some woman's living in a high-rise apartment and she's getting a, a, a an obscene phone caller that can clearly see her. So she is she decides to essentially hack back and try to figure out who's looking at her. So she goes out and buys a telescope and starts looking at the apartment building across from her and finally decides who the guy is and turns the tables on him and starts hacking him back and, and prank calling him to the point where he commits suicide. He jumps out the window and kills himself. And, and it is just as he's jumping out, the phone rings, and it's her obscene phone caller saying, hey, I was gone for a couple weeks, but I'm back now. Mm. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. Oh. I thought, so you were gonna, I thought you were setting us up for, like, the net. But no, this no, was I wasn't. Actually, I thought no, this it was, was different. like CSI Cyber, so, like, once <laughs> no. I got hacked and then everyone died kind of thing. Nope. This that? only it made my printer catch on fire. Right? Don't, Wasn't that don't get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I haven't watched it yet. I I refrained, but no. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm tongue in cheek when I say that, but I, I think some of it's at least kind of interesting. Um, but hack back? No, I don't. I don't recommend that. Now, uh, okay, is Carlos. this a law? Was this approved or this is no? This was it. just someone lobbying to Congress to say we should allow this kind of thing. Okay, it, it, it won't fly. Probably somebody um, that's very uninformed about hacking back, hacking back, and right what the ramifications are. But it captures <laughs> a media moment. Hey, Carlos, did you read the story about the uh, the virus on this uh, police body camera? Um, I heard about it. Haven't uh, yeah. read it. <laughs> this one is like those, that, the little camera. One with some ficker. Yeah, it was con ficker. It's uh, eye power. And um, these are on cameras that are, are mounted on, on police officers. Uh, I'm assuming the military uses similar technology, probably a very different vendor. Um, but it's similar technology where there's a... Probably not. But, probably but, not. Okay, but maybe in your probably utopian not. world, in my utopian you can world, think that. <laughs> all the cameras are secure from hacking, Jeff. Except for this one. Because they all do vulnerability management. Um, but this one, uh, some of their cameras were being used to propagate the Conficker virus. So if a camera was connected to a system that didn't have antivirus software to mm -hmm. detect Conficker, which is like most people can detect Conficker. Well, right. a lot of, okay, some antivirus <laughs> vendors can detect the strain of Conficker. Right. Uh, it, it, it would infect uh, said system. Gotcha. Um, and it's kind yeah, of... A, no, go ahead, what we're seeing here is supply chain. Um, yep. the, a compromise of the supply chain. And, and these cameras are probably made in China, which means we should hack back to China and figure out who put this virus on here. And, and, right. and, 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 and what will happen is that many, how many people out there, when they get a printer or they get a new device from a vendor, do they actually check that device? Do they scan that device for vulnerabilities? Do they um, test if, if it is communicating to the outside world? How is it communicating to the outside world once connected to a network? Not many organizations actually have um, that level of maturity and resources to actually do that. Um, I think the only example is when uh, back in my Hewlett Packard compact days, I remember one of our federal uh, customers, actually when they wanted a demo and something, we would go give them the gear and they would go like, okay, here's the check for it. No, no, it's a demo piece of gear. No, 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 no. You don't get it. We're going to test it. We're going to play with it, and then we're going to destroy it if we are not buying it. And, and but you're not getting it back. <laughs> and that's the way they op actually operate it. That's uh, and, and that is true lessons learned in security. A lot of people have actually not learned that, um, and we can even see examples of it. Uh, let's say from Snowden. Snowden mentioned how the NSA actually got uh, between. A piece of Cisco gear or Dell server before it reached its target, and they were able to intercept it as it traversed to them, and they put implants on it. What does it not permit that a criminal actually does it, like it happened in the UK with some point of sale terminals where people were actually able to find out who was the supplier, get it at one of the warehouses as it was being chipped and actually put in a back door to the point of, uh, of sales that went to the uh, 
stores, uh, to, I think, with supermarkets in the UK, and then they were able to extract the data of the credit cards and transactions. Uh, supply chain hacking is something that many people do not consider mm. in their uh, risk matrix. Right. I have nothing to say about that. Does that relate to PCI, Jeff? No, it relates <laughs> relates more to my background. <laughs> Does PCI so, cover so supply, supply chain security? security. It's choke no, you it out. doesn't. It's good. It's gonna happen. It should. Is Kevin there? What happened to Kevin? We, uh, we, to have, we, we had catastro I, I think we, like catastrophic issues, is how I described them. I think we uh, redacted them. Anonymous got him? Is that what Sam <laughs> said that? <laughs> oh, that's really funny. We retracted them. Um, yeah. Did you guys hear about the, the failed Windows 3.1 system that was uh, attributed to taking down the Paris yep. airport? Windows 3.1 is bulletproof. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that's apparently what happened. Yeah. But who? What caused the failure? Does, did anyone like figure that out from the story? No, nobody read the details. Yeah. We just read the headline. You but kind of had me at Windows three point one. You. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. most people were kind of. It's the flashback. We're kind of like, like a T-shirt. You had me at Windows three point one. <laughs> It's like they got to go back and pull out that box of like 27 discs to reload it back up. I mean, Windows 3.1 was almost before the days of hacking. So are there a lot of known vulnerabilities for Windows 3.1? But I don't think it was hacked. I think it was just failed. Features. It was it just crashed. But if Undocumented <laughs> feature. <laughs> but like what, what, modern, what modern hardware can even run Windows 3.1? Was it just well, a hardware failure? VMware. Uh, you, you know, VMware, VMware can run Windows 3. Have you run Windows 3.1 in VMware? Probably could. I've run right? Windows yeah. 95. Yeah, early VMware run it in was box. around the era of 3.1. Yeah, Interesting. And, and, and we're going back to that mentality of many customers. Like, it works. It works. Why should I upgrade? Right. Uh, for example, I still find in a lot of pharmaceuticals, Windows NT4. And when you ask him, why are you running Windows NT4? Yeah. Oh, we were able to get a waiver because we implemented this mitigations for it. And like, yeah, but it's still Windows NT4. And they're going like, yeah, do you know how expensive it is to get something like this certified? And we still see it in hospitals. In hospitals, I still see uh, Windows uh, 2000. Uh, well, yeah, running in look, gear that I'm getting into. Well, I was walking through, I was in Canada three times the last two months, and I won't say which airline, but it's one that's prominent in Canada. I kept walking past the <coughs> kiosks. Isn't it Canada seeing, Air? I, I'm not <laughs> saying. Windows XP everywhere. Windows XP. Every lock screen was a yeah. Windows XP uh, screensaver. Yeah, but you know what I think is in interesting if you go back to the NT4 stuff is, you know, a lot of that came online when we were terrified about y2k and talking about what we were going to do and we, we that was at the beginning of a big client server push and so you know we talked before today already about people that have local admin and and even sometimes worse in, uh, enabled on some of these computers and the ability to get to the domain admin and everything else right and and so millions of dollars of custom code ri rides on top of that and so when you say to these companies i mean come on fix it that that's not a clear path, easy fix for them, which is again, right? We go back to it. it it's the code. You know, there, there's one thing in the, in the link that you put up about this article in Paris that I thought was actually kind of interesting. Uh, I'll quote from it. In Paris, we have only three specialists who can deal with uh, this system. And, uh, and, and this problem's getting worse as, quote, one of them is retiring next year and we haven't found anyone to replace him. Yep. 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 It's interesting. We were it's having a, a, an it's, interesting it's a risk that we have to start thinking about. Are we relying on code bases and systems that the pe the people who know them intimately we didn't capture their knowledge? We haven't transitioned to anybody else, and they will be aging out or selecting out of the workforce. I was just reminded of a <clears throat> conversation we we're having yesterday about Windows NT and some of its roots into VMS and interesting conversation. <laughs> It was a, a, a and, trip down you know, memory was lane. That, was that in Paul's how, Utopia? How many, no, it wasn't. It how was, many uh, point-of-sale systems are built on DOS mm -hmm. or a particular flavor of DOS that we won't mention? Right. But hopefully you know, no one's still running Token Ring. Yeah, my favorite one is surprised. the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah. I made a joke about it. Go ahead, Carl. Sorry. I was way off topic anyway. 
Let's take a weirder kind of example. Uh, you know, Patriot missile batteries, the guys that sent up a missile to intercept another, and we were providing those for Israel for their Iron Dome. That runs OpenBMS, which mm. is mm. an operating system that's no longer being actively developed. It is not. Yeah, it actually ceased development, right? Which is too bad. I mean, it, yep. it was a really great operating system, to be honest with you. As far as operating systems go, that's a good reason to replace it with something else. Then it's true. I mean, that's kind of but, the way things. Well, you know, work. with VMS, the, we still the, fly the, drones. Predator drones are still flown with Windows XP. That's Nick and I were trying <laughs> to remember what was the get. what was the file system like delimiter. It wasn't a forward slash or a backslash. It was like a, a question mark and a greater than sign or something. Yeah, it was weird. Like, it was weird. It was yep. way too weird to work with. But VMS, it, despite that. VMS was an awesome operating system. And That's Windows where I learned to code Pascal. There's actually code in common with it, right? Microsoft bought, like, the operating system from the guy that I don't remember. Well, the uh, irony so Part of, of Windows this. NT clustering came from them hiring the guys from digital. Yes, you actually. said clustering. <laughs> Yeah, imagine yeah, that. VMS, DOS, you know, what makes all these systems sort of interesting from a attack perspective is they're so stripped down and rudimentary, yeah. there isn't that much to do with them. No. I mean, you don't have a whole lot, but, you know, with all the new technology, all the new operating <sighs> systems, there was no cloud frameworks there. like we were mm -hmm. talking about earlier, every time we add something new, we're opening the door to all sorts of exploitation and vulnerabilities because we add all this functionality. But, you know, those old DOS systems and, you know, talk about hacking mainframes, nobody has to, nobody knows how to do it. But except any, that one guy, Phil, except for that one guy. But there's not a whole lot to <laughs> no, do. No, there is a there is a guy. There's actually two guys. We had him on the show. But oh. well, the, two the guys. thing is that you're you're trading a security risk for an operational one. You're, you, so now you're talking about a piece of gear that almost nobody is going to actively be looking for exploits or have the knowledge to exploit it. But operationally. Now you have a problem of a piece of system that when it goes down, who do you call for help? Where are you going to get a patch for something that all of a sudden is breaking? Or where are you going to even get a part? Well, the, the irony is, and until this, yeah, and on. Windows 3.1 is probably the exception, but a lot of these older systems, they just didn't break down. Well, in speaking of support, uh, if the stories that I, I heard, and I've heard this from multiple people, is that there's like blocks of code that's like, no one understands this, but the original dude that wrote it. Right. And don't don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't <laughs> change it, and don't try oh. and understand it. Like it just works. So mm -hmm. like, six, you talk six about six years a, ago, uh, before I left Hewlett Packard to go to Tenable, I remember uh, there was a project that I was working with a, uh, a, another solution architect and a guy from sales and consulting, and we're looking at right now here in Puerto Rico the system that manages all all of your driver license and all of your tickets and everything is called David. And that system is written on on a VAX. It's not even VMS. It's a VAX. Mm. And that was before the uh, Alpha, and, and, wasn't it? Now we're yeah, talking and, punch and, cards. Yeah, Alpha. Yeah, and, and, but Alpha was the... It, yeah. it was running in an Alpha system. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the guy was saying, no, we're going to port it into an Alpha system to VMS. And then they go like, well, we don't have the source code. And he goes... Dude, I read somewhere that reverse engineering is easy. We can go <laughs> in, reverse engineer those binaries, and then have a kid program that in Java or something else, and we can put it in an alpha server either running OpenVMS or running HPUX. And me and the other uh, solution architect, were, were, our jaws just dropped at the idea that the sales guy was trying to propose in front of the customer, and we were like, no. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we're not reversing it, reversing during something that runs in a VAX. First of all, we have to find somebody who knows how to read that assembly code and a tool to do it. And then yeah. we're not finding anybody porting that uh, over to HPOX. No. <laughs> we're well, just HP bought, uh, HP owned the VMS code, right, through acquisitions of digital. Right? Yeah, but, but the programmer that they hired out of Florida to write all of that code uh, was not giving away the source code. I gotcha. So so you had the binaries only. 
Interesting. Even to this day, but it, it, still, all of that stuff still runs on that BMX. I remember it breaking at one point. Mm -hmm. and nobody can get a new license. Nobody can register a new car for a couple of weeks. It was in the news. It was in the newspapers. And I remember that we had to scramble to eBay to buy the parts to get those boxes up and running. And we had to get one of the old engineers from the digital days out of Ugh. retirement and pay him a, a couple of yep. thousand dollars to come in and help us <laughs> change the part. Probably a couple of tens and, and, of thousands and, of dollars. And you were going smart. like, it doesn't break. It's it's one of those systems that never breaks. Yeah, but what happens when it when does? When it does, right. We should uh, get someone on who was into the VMS thing. That'd be a fun interview. That would be a fun interview. Uh, I remember that about uh, about Ellis was directory, I think, was the command that you did to list the contents of a folder. And yeah, it was it was weird, dude. We um, and, and everything was in in capital letters in caps lock. And the te the telnet protocol was different. Was it was it Absidic? It wasn't regular telnet, was it? Maybe it was. It, it, it was talk. What was it? Talk was a program that you used to chat with other people. In yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we should. Uh, so I, I worked for a lottery company that dealt heavily in that. Hmm. Hopefully not now. Well, yeah, considering it's all end of life, who knows? Changing a directory, uh, set default and the name of the directory to change the directory. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's funny, Carlos. You and I, I, I had to spend a little time <laughs> on the command line of some of the, the uh, VMS systems. Uh, at the time, and it was uh, a whole new world, but it was interesting. It's a we should do a segment on it. It's we worth should. doing a segment on. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, know of, uh, of a certified BMS engineer that works with us at Burke. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, he's a pre-sales guy. Well, we're way off topic now. We it are. was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. it, it was, was a lot fun. of fun. It was a good trip down memory lane. I so, want. Map Seven's out. What's that? Nmap 7 is out. Nmap 7 is out. Awesome. So better portability, faster, better stack for IPv6. That's awesome. I, I love testing new versions of Nmap. Uh, we haven't talked about a new version of Nmap in quite some time. So maybe it's time to have Fyodor back on the show. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been on in a long time. So cool. Well, thanks everyone for participating. I'm sorry we lost not Kevin. Jeff Mann's here in studio. Michael Santarcangelo and Carlos Perez are online via Skype. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll see everyone uh, not next week because it's Thanksgiving. There is no show. But after that, we'll see everyone over and out.